Hey everybody, I'm Elizabeth McSwan from Emac and Hedwig. In today's video, we are going to be talking about exposure settings for wildlife photographers, part one. So here we go. Everybody, welcome back to another video on my channel. I know it's been a really long time since I've made a video. So if you have subscribed to my channel and you're still here, thank you. I really appreciate you. And I have a lot more content coming out over the next few weeks and months. I have some owl photography project updates and more videos like this one where I share my thoughts and tips on wildlife photography in general. This video, as you may have gleaned from the title is going to be about exposure or more specifically exposure settings because the truth is that exposure settings that is aperture shutter speed and iso or some people say iso don't just control what we would consider exposure sort of our the tonal range of our image our exposure settings actually control more than that and in this first part i'm going to be talking about why it's important for the wildlife photographer specifically to get out of auto exposure and be a more active participant in the exposure settings that you are using. Understanding exposure and exposure settings is really important for any photographer, but especially I would say for the wildlife photographer. Knowledge is power, right? So the more we can understand about the technology that we're holding in our hands, the more confidence we're gonna have, right? So the, the, the more enjoyable it's going to be to go out there and photograph, the better our photography is going to get the higher our keeper rate is going to be, and the better equipped we are to troubleshoot any issues that we're having when we're out in the field. It is so soul crushing to be out in the field, having this amazing encounter with a wild animal or bird, only to be having a technical problem and not know why it's happening and not knowing how to fix it. It's just a knife in the heart. And certainly you could be having a technical problem that has nothing to do with exposure, right? But it could certainly be a factor. So understanding about exposure can help you either outright solve the problem or help you solve it through process of elimination. Unfortunately, Exposure settings is not that easy to wrap our brains around. It is often counterintuitive, there's often math involved, and there's just no fast track way. There's no magic button. It just takes good old fashioned learning, practice, practice, practice out in the field and supplementing that perhaps with say articles or videos like this one that will hopefully give you uh, tools that you can then apply when you're out in the field. And it just takes time. It just takes time to develop that brain muscle memory. And because of that, I can completely understand why a lot of photographers, they get their camera, they get their new lens, they have a fresh battery, blank memory card, they just wanna go out and photograph and they don't wanna think about all of the things that are involved with exposure settings. I mean, it's kind of boring, right? There are so many more fun things to think about when you're out in the field photographing, not to mention other things that are just as important as exposure settings, such as like autofocusing and just getting the bird in your frame can often be a challenge. So it's completely understandable why people just switch that dial to auto and they figure my camera will make those decisions for me and I will be fine. And I would say for most photographers, most of the time, that is probably true but I would say it's not as true for wildlife photographers. So when we're thinking about exposure settings, we have to think about it from these sort of two different trains of thought that come together in order to create our image. On the one hand, we have tonal range, right? Exposure, essentially. That is how our highlights, midtones, and shadows, which all images are comprised of, how they are represented in our image. And regardless of the decisions that we're making both during capture and in post-processing, I think that for most photographers, wildlife photographers, most of the time, we're looking for tonal authenticity. We're looking for those tones to feel realistic. 
even if they were perhaps adjusted. In other words, we want our whites and highlights to be bright and white while hopefully also retaining detail. We want the same thing for our blacks and shadows, those darker areas, we want them to be dark, but we also want them to retain detail, especially if these tones are, are in our subject. It's especially important because that's the sharpest part of our image, right? So we really want to make sure that those tones are properly exposed and we retain as much detail as possible. If it's in the background or foreground, maybe it doesn't matter as much. But tonal range is not the only thing that we care about when it comes to exposure settings. We also care about sharpness. Right? Again, most of us, most of the time, are looking for sharpness in our images at least somewhere, at least the head and eye of our subject, if not more of our subject, right? So we care about sharpness. We also care about image quality and getting the best image quality that we can get within the kind of parameters of that you know, shooting situation. So therefore, we need to care about not only how our settings work together in order to create that tonal range, we also care about them individually to give us sharpness and good image quality. So when we're in auto, we're actually giving our cameras a lot of responsibility. And from a tonal range perspective, I would say that most cameras have a pretty decent metering system, right? They can read the tones of our scene and they can get us pretty close, right? They're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a good starting point. And so from that perspective, I think our cameras can be very helpful in giving us a end result that we can work with, especially if we're shooting raw, we, you know, we can take that and go into post-processing and really fine tune that exposure. But it doesn't always choose settings that set the wildlife photographer up for success. For most types of photography, I would say there's a setting within the exposure triangle that means a little bit more than the other two. It's a little bit more important, and we usually set that one first, and then base the other two settings on that first initial one. And for wildlife photographers, that setting is shutter speed. We are concerned about shutter speed from kind of two different angles. Again, sort of the two different trains of thought coming together. And the first one is you know, we're oftentimes photographing fast moving subjects. So we need to choose a, sh a shutter speed that's high enough to freeze that action. Uh, but we also need to think about something else and that is camera shake. Camera shake happens when your camera moves a little bit during capture, which pretty much happens to all of us. Even when we're on a tripod, it, our cameras are gonna move a little bit. And camera shake happens when our shutter speed is too slow to compensate for that movement. And this is something that can happen to any photographer, not just wildlife photographers. But I would say wildlife photographers think about it more because the longer your focal length is, the higher your shutter speed needs to be in order to eliminate potential camera shake. And wildlife photographers are working with longer focal lengths. So we need to make sure that our shutter speed is higher to compensate for that. You may have heard of the reciprocal rule, which is really hard to say. The reciprocal rule states that in order to eliminate camera shake at the minimum, your shutter speed needs to be at the reciprocal of whatever your effective focal length is or higher, preferably higher. So for example, if you are photographing with a 500 millimeter focal length on a full frame body, your shutter speed at minimum needs to be 1 500th of a second. Again, preferably higher than that. Now, I don't really think of the reciprocal rule as a rule. I think of it more as a guideline. I think that with proper practice of good hand-holding sharpness technique, which I did a video about if you want to check it out, you can dial down your shutter speed below the reciprocal, slower than the reciprocal, and still be successful in getting sharp shots. But regardless of your ability to get sharp shots at slow shutter speeds, your camera choosing those shutter speeds for you really doesn't set you up for success, at least in the same way as somebody that's photographing with a shorter focal length. For example, let's say that your camera chose like one one hundredth of a second for you as your shutter speed. For somebody that's shooting with a 50 millimeter focal length, that's probably fine. Does it guarantee a sharp shot? No, it depends on what they're photographing, but certainly it sets them up for success better than 
if somebody was photographing with a 500 millimeter focal length with that same shutter speed, one one hundredth. For a wildlife photographer, one one hundredth of a second is pretty slow. Can you get a sharp shot? Sure, you can, depending on some factors. Does it set you up for success? No. So if you're a wildlife photographer and you've been using auto and you have been struggling with sharpness, this could be one of the reasons why. Because your camera is just not choosing shutter speeds that are setting you up for success. And so that's my argument, you guys, for wildlife photographers getting out of auto and being more active participants in the settings that they are using for their images. And so if you're a wildlife photographer who has been on auto and has been kind of thinking about getting out of auto and into more manual settings, I hope this video was inspirational to you. And so now where do we go from here? That's what part two is going to be about. In part two, I'm going to be talking about my point of view regarding exposure from a tonal range perspective. I'm gonna be talking about histograms, how I approach exposure, and hopefully give you guys some tips on how to approach ex exposure settings from that perspective. And then part three, I'm gonna be going into the individual settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, and my kind of my thoughts and tips on how to approach exposure settings individually. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I plan on making content here much more frequently. So if you like it, like it and uh, subscribe to my channel. Click the bell. You know what to do. If you also want to follow me on social media, you can. The best way to do that is on Instagram. You can also check out my Patreon page. There's a lot of good stuff going on over there. So until the next video, everyone, take care. Happy adventuring. Happy shooting. See you later. Bye.